read a scripture for you. This is Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen. You, won't you be seated? By the way, I also want to say how grateful I am because uh, one of our elders, Mike Sullivan, actually played drums this morning and he's doing double duty and I'm just so grateful for him and man, he's got his plate full today, but such a blessing. He's on. How's it going so far? <laughs> well, good morning. I'm actually trying to pull up my uh, um, there we go. I thought it would be kind of funny if I came out of the drum room and wearing a robe and a scepter or something like that and sermon surprise. I'm really excited about today. I've had this date circled on my calendar for a long time. And I want to start by saying thank you, Becky Rouse, for putting my slides together. You did a great job. She did all kinds of things to make them more interesting than they really are. So that's kind of fun. But I want to talk to you this morning about a passage that is really significant to me, which is, comes out of Second Chronicles chapter 20. And I believe it's a good model for how we as a church need to face our fears and face battles that come against us. And it really became significant for me on a trip to Israel. Nina and I have, been to, have had the good fortune of being in Israel three times um, because of Dave and Ellie Lee. Not that they paid for it, but they arranged a tour that we had with a man that some of you know, R.E.A. Bar David, is um, a man, if you can go to the next slide. I love this picture of him because this is how I see him. He's, he's had some health issues lately, but he's a man after God's own heart, and boy is he wise. And on one of our tours, he said, if you ever get in a situation where you don't know what to do and you're truly afraid, read 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it is definitely a model for how we handle the battles in our life. Did I lose my microphone again? Okay. Okay. So it was probably written by Ezra in 872 BC, so it's about 3,000 years old. And Jehoshaphat is spelled a multitude of different ways. Some spell it Jehoshaphat, some spell it Jehoshaphat, some Josephat. For the sake of this, we're going to call him Jehoshaphat. And I looked and I tried to figure out where does the statement or the phrase jumping Jehoshaphat come from? And it's all over the board. It has to, you know, they said that Jehoshaphat used to jump out of his throne to meet the prophets, whoever came to him, but 
It was also in some stories and books in the 1800s. Never got some consistency on that. But he was king of Judah from 873 to 849 BC. And unfortunately, the kingdom of Israel was divided at that time. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, became king of Israel and foolishly divided the kingdom into two parts, Israel and Judah. And Jehoshaphat disliked that greatly. In fact, he was so disappointed that Israel was a divided nation, but he was a good king. And unfortunately, the king of Israel at that time, Ahab, was a very bad king. Jehoshaphat didn't like the fact that secularism and paganism had infected Judah, so much so to the point that he sent teachers throughout Judah to teach the word of God. Meanwhile, Ahab in Israel married Jezebel, a Phoenician princess who brought Baal worship to Israel. And um, if you can go to the next slide. Jehoshaphat was a good man, and he walked in the way of Asa, his father. Now, Asa was king of Judah before him, and he had, a, he had a time where he was facing a battle, and he went to the king of Syria and offered him silver and gold to help him fight his battles. But Jehoshaphat went to the Lord. And I want to show you this map. I've got this cheap little pointer here. Hopefully it will work. So in the time of Second Chronicles, when it was written... Ammon, which is here, Moab, and Mount Seir, which is somewhere in here, had gathered to, at Edom and was poised to attack Judah. And when Je, uh, Jehoshaphat got word of it, they were already in En Gedi, which is right about here. And the wilderness, I don't know if you can see that pointer or not, but the wilderness where the confrontation took place was just south of Jerusalem. So what I want to do with this is I've got 90 minutes of material here that has to be boiled down to about 30 minutes, and I'm going to go through it as quickly as I can. But what I wanted to do was just start with a little bit of history, a little bit of background, then I'd like to tell you the story as it's recorded in Second Chronicles. And then we're going to go through it verse by verse to see what Jehoshaphat did, what the people did, what the Lord did, and allow the Lord to speak to us as to how we should handle ourselves as a church. So, we have three weapons against us, obviously, in this world. We have Satan, our flesh, and the world, but we also have three weapons for us. As Jehoshaphat demonstrated, we pray before the battle. We praise through the battle, and we proclaim his name after the battle. So let me tell you the story of Second Chronicles chapter 20, and I'm going to try to do this by telling you. So I'd like you to ask you to put your finger in your Bible and close your Bible and just listen to these words. Afterwards, we'll open our Bibles back up and we'll look at it, okay? So it starts out, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Meunites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. 
In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now, behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing in praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde. And behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, and precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were three days in taking the spoil. It was so much. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Barakah to this day. 
Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. And wouldn't it be nice if the next line was, and they all lived happily ever after. But they did not. Because just a few verses later it says, the high places, however, were not taken away. For the people had not yet turned their hearts to the God of their fathers. I read that and I thought, you have got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. What else do they need to see? You know, uh, Moses, God asked Moses, what do I have to do to get these people to love me? I have a slide for that. And the Lord said to Moses in Numbers 14, 11, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? Well, God is omniscient. He doesn't need to know the answer to that question, but I think that might've been for Moses' benefit. What do they have to do? I mean, this is consistent throughout the Old Testament. God liberated Israel from Egypt. They saw the plagues. They saw the pillar of fire. They saw the Red Sea part and the floor dry up. And they saw the entire Egyptian army drowned. And the first thing they did when they got to the other side was they started complaining about the food. I know maybe I'm being too harsh, but come on. Wouldn't you at that point have trusted God to eat? I'll eat sand and trust that God will turn it into food. But they didn't turn their hearts to the God of their fathers. Stunning. So let's open your Bibles now, and let's take a look at this verse by verse. The first thing that Jehoshaphat did when he heard this was happening, when he was afraid, is he set his face to seek the Lord. Let that be our default in any situation where we're afraid and we're not really sure what to do. He set his face to seek the Lord and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. I'm not good at fasting, but I've done it recently. And boy, did I see God answer prayer. And it's not so much that, I don't know, there's some mystery there as to how that works. But that's our model. Set your face to seek the Lord and fast and pray. And then he proclaimed a fast, he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah and he assembled everybody together. Everybody stood in the presence of the Lord's house and then he prayed. And what a prayer. Other than Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel, this is the greatest prayer to me in the Old Testament. In that prayer, he reminded God of who he was and his power. Verse 6, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. God didn't need to hear that. But I think he delighted in hearing that from Jehoshaphat. So he reminded God who he was. And I would say, this is not God against God. This is God against all of creation, potentially. You rule over all. Do we regularly confess that God is sovereign over this thing that we're afraid of? I say that to my own shame. Secondly, he reminded God of what he had done. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? 
he reminded what he, God of what he had promised. Same verse. He had promised this land to the descendants of Abraham. He reminded God of what the people had done in verse 8. And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a house for your name. He reminded God of what they would do when trouble came. Verse 9, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house. One of these days, I have got to organize my notes better. He also reminded God what God told them not to do in verse 10. Don't invade the people from Egypt coming up the Moabites and Ammonites. Told them not to do it. And I think this really kind of made Jehoshaphat angry in the end when he was saying his prayer. Because if you think about it, from a human standpoint, Jehoshaphat could have said, we could have dealt with these people if you'd have just stepped aside and let us alone. But you told us not to, so we were obedient to you. That's one of those things where I look at conflict in my life and I think, maybe I could have handled this differently, but God chose another way. Well, God's way in this case was better. God told Moses not to attack Moab and Ammon because they were descendants of Esau. God also... Uh, Jehoshaphat also reminded God of the fruit of their obedience in verse 11. Their weakness and their lack of knowledge in verse 12. Will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde. So they were putting the ball in God's court clearly. And I would suggest that we do the same because there's only so much that we can do as people compared to what the Spirit of God can do. We put God in such a small box. It's really unfortunate. So, what did the people do? Well, first, they stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And I love that. They didn't, the men didn't get together and say, okay, get your families, protect them at home. We got to figure this out. Their little ones, that's the first one that's mentioned. Their little ones, their wives and their children, they all sought the Lord for help. That's in verse 13. They listened to the spirit of the Lord through Jehaziel the prophet. Now that, that's one thing that for me, I it would be nice if every time there was a battle going on in your life, you had a prophet that could say to you, thus says the Lord to you. Many try to do that these days, but we don't have that. But we do have what they didn't have. We have the entirety of the scriptures. We have the spirit of God living inside of us. And we have a multitude of counselors around us. It takes faith to believe and it probably took faith for Jehoshaphat and Judah to believe too, even though the prophet was speaking because they could have thought, well, how does he know? But he spoke boldly and told them what to do. They believed, they received instruction, they gave thanks and they worshiped and they went out. That's another big thing to me. They went out. The instruction that they received was not, okay, I'm going to kill all these people so you don't need to worry about it. So go hunker down in your homes, read your Torah, and after I've killed everybody, I'll send a messenger to you and tell you it's safe to come out now. He didn't tell them that. No, two times he said, go out against them. You need to go out against them and the Lord will be with you. And it's interesting, too, that Jehoshaphat was wise. He was a very good king, and he took counsel with the people before they engaged this conflict. He didn't just say, hey, I'm the king. i got to figure this out. Trust me. 
He took counsel with the people, and then he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army. Weird. He's telling them, dress up in your finest, and we're going to put the worship team out in front of the army. And the worship team is thinking, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) That makes no sense. But it's just another way that God set the stage so that the people really could see that it was God, not them. And then they had to sing. They had to sing in praise. And it wasn't until then that God set the ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir so that they were routed. And I think, how does that happen? How do people just decide to kill each other? Well, this could be speculation. It is speculation on my part. But I think the way it happened was the men of Ammon and Moab, they were the ones kind of in charge. Mount Seir was kind of along for the ride. And Mount Seir saying, well, okay, here's what we think we should do. We'll go to, from the south. You come around from the east, and you come around from the west, and we'll just surround them. And the guys from Moab said, no, 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 you guys from Mount Seir, you always think you got it all figured out. We're not going to do that. We're going to do this. And then pretty soon it's like, okay, well, then when we get to the promised land, we're going to take this part. Nope, nope, you're always, you're always running things. We're going to do it this way. And it turned into this huge fight, and they start fighting each other. And if there's time at the end, there's a, there's a story that I'd like to tell you about uh, Arie and how that happened during the Yom Kippur War. It actually happened. So they all end up killing each other. And so then, everybody's dead. Wow. They didn't have to do anything. They just saw the dead bodies. So then God told them, take all their stuff. Take it. And I think, why did he tell him to do that? Why didn't he, this is defiled stuff, pile it all up and burn it, or don't touch it. He didn't say that. He said, he said there was in great numbers, goods, clothing, and precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were three days in taking the spoil. It was so much. To me, another speculation here, it's okay to enjoy your stuff. Some of you have things that you consider precious things, whether it's a tea set from your grandmother. I have a violin that belonged to my great-grandfather. It's okay to have precious stuff. Jesus, it all is his anyway. In John 1, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. It's all his stuff, and God said, take it, enjoy it. It's yours. Don't make an idol out of it. That's what wrecks us. I have a friend who said, you know, God, it just seems like, I feel like our perspective is God says, okay, I'm going to give you this thing that you're asking for, but if I catch you enjoying it, I'm going to take it away from you. That's the enemy. Enjoy the things that God has given you. And if you're taking notes, write down Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 20, and read that, and tell me if you disagree with me. So God's goodness does not, is not contingent on our circumstances. When we invite the Lord to be in charge of our circumstances, he will be present and will take care of our circumstances according to his will. And we will be grateful for that battle because we experience a deeper dependency on the Lord. Now I realize in this moment that I have completely put Gretchen in a really bad spot because she's probably wondering what's the next slide because there's a bunch of them. Can you show the slide of the quote from uh, Corey Ten Boom? I love this quote. Don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. What wings are to a bird and sails to a ship, so is prayer to the soul. And the next one from D.L. Moody. Some people think that God is troubled by our constant coming and asking. But the way to trouble God is to never come at all. And then I have a quote at the end from Johnny Erickson Tata. And this might not seem to be related to the message, but I think it's very related. 
when we ask the why questions, like Jehoshaphat, why didn't you let us attack him when we could have had the chance? When we ask the why questions, he doesn't always give us the answer as much as he gives us more of himself. I'm so thankful that we are tied to a God who sees us, who knows us. He knows where we're weak. He knows where we're vulnerable. He knows where we're afraid. And he is all-powerful. Jehoshaphat knew that too. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. So, the story that REA told that still kind of blows my mind that relates to this experience 3,000 years ago in Judah was during the Yom Kippur War in 1973. REA was a paratrooper in the Israeli army. I don't know if it was called the IDF back then, but he experienced the Six-Day War in, in 67 and the, and the uh, Yom Kippur War in 1973. In 1973, Syria attacked from the north with 300 tanks. Israel had 75 tanks. For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And at night, there, I believe it was at night, if Dave and Ellie were here, they'd correct me if I'm wrong on this, but what happened was, unbeen, it, a mystery to Israel, God jammed the radar signals and the identif- location, whatever they were using at that time to determine who the enemy was, God confused them, and the Syrians started shooting each other. Now, you can say that's coincidence, but I think that's a modern-day Ammonites and Moabites and Meunites coming after Judah. I feel like, in wrapping this up, I feel like my calling, if you'll allow me that, is just this sort of thing. Not so much, I'm not so much an evangelist as much as I feel like I've been called to speak truth and encourage you to hang in there. You are on the right side of history. We are on the right side of history. We win in the end, no matter how ugly things get. And things, as you are aware, are getting really ugly around us right now. There's some weird stuff going on. And it almost seems like the enemy has had restraint removed from him. Isn't it interesting that so many of our discussions lately have to do with that very thing? Do not lose heart. God will defeat our enemies. He will sort it all out. He just asks us to trust him. And I think that the times that God's heart is the most pleased is when his children go through really hard things and say, I don't like it, I don't understand it, but God, I trust you. It makes me think Valerie Hall when she was in her latter days. I I talked to her and she, she was just really declining. And life was not good for her. Life was not easy. And, but she kept saying, oh, I trust him. I trust him. I trust him. So let's do that, and let's let's pray and ask God to give us the grace to trust him regardless of our circumstances. And let's, let's use this passage as a model for how we respond to evil that comes against us and trouble in our life. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us beyond what we deserve. I pray, Lord, a protection, a blessing of protection on each and every person and family that's represented here. Lord, that you would protect us if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine. We will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. In Jesus' name, amen.